Our guest today is Dr. Michael Humer. Um, he is a professor at the, uh, of, of philosophy at the University of Colorado uh, at Boulder. And uh, he is also a vegetarian and vegan activist. Uh, and he has books on that. Um, one of his uh, more well-known books is The Problem of Political Authority. Um, and he also has a book called Ethical Vegetarianism or Dialogues on Ethical Vegetarianism. Uh, is there anything else you would like to say about yourself? Uh, I don't know. Um, yeah, um, look up my blog, Fake News, spelled F-A-K-E-N-O-U-S dot N-E-T. And um, yeah, I have like eight books and like 70 articles in various areas of philosophy. Awesome. I'll put a link to that down uh, in the description whenever this goes on YouTube and also in the Discord server later on. Um, so uh, I guess we'll open up with our first question. Um, so what is what is the what is in your opinion what's the strongest argument in favor of veganism? Um, I mean, I think there's one main argument, right, which is uh, you shouldn't cause an enormous amount of suffering for relatively trivial reasons. That seems true to me. And, uh, and uh, factory farming causes an enormous amount of suffering for comparatively trivial reasons, so we shouldn't do it. Also, if, um, if something is wrong, then it's wrong to pay other people to do it. So if factory farming is wrong, then you also should not pay other people for doing it. Hmm. Pretty, pretty simple. Cool, so um, let's hop, let's, I guess let's change realms a little bit. What's your opinion on Rothbard? Oh, uh, you know, I mean, I kind of like him. He's entertaining and fun, uh, but I also find him overly doctrinaire. So, you know, like, uh, I like David Friedman better, like he seems more reasonable and whatever. <laughs> if there's a disagreement between the two of them, then David Friedman is right. But, um, you know, because like, you know, he has things like, oh, you know, there's like a chapter talking about blackmail or something. And he's like, how could blackmail possibly be a crime? You know, that's ridiculous. <laughs> and I, like, he will take something that's completely obvious and, you know, like act like it's totally absurd. <laughs> And then say something that's really questionable, like, you know, it's like very, very sort of like absolutist type moral principles, and then treat that as if, you know, that's just obviously true and has been completely proven. All right. So, um, and, and David Freeman's actually uh, recommended that we have you on. So that's one of the reasons that you're here with us today. Um, Good, yeah. So, so uh, where did your journey begin? This is from Al. Uh well, it began when I was born in a hospital. No, um, uh, I guess about libertarianism, I assume. Um, like in that case, I mean, uh, in one sense, like I think I'm a natural born libertarian. And, uh, you know, like there's sort of like personality traits that go along with being libertarian. And like I have all of them. And, you know, like libertarians like science fiction and uh, uh, whatever, you know. Uh, computers and computer games it's like, like everything that libertarians like I like you know I like bitcoin too whatever um, so um okay but I didn't realize that I was a libertarian at first so like you know when I was a high school student or something and I didn't know anything and like I thought oh you know socialism sounds good <laughs> because I just like heard it, I, I took like high school debate and I heard all this stuff about how socialism solves all the world's problems. And I thought the fact that people were saying this meant that there was like good reason to believe it. <laughs> like like there's so many people saying so many great things about it. I thought that meant that they had justification for believing that. But uh, later I was wrong. I found out I was wrong. Um, I read Ayn Rand when I was in college. There were like three separate people who recommended her to me. And when the third person said it, I broke down and finally got uh, the fountainhead and read it. And um, I, you know, I just thought it was brilliant. Um, I read a, the first thing that I read from Rand was, there's a, um, a part of this book for the new intellectual that's an excerpt from Atlas Shrugged about the Starnes Motor Company or something, whatever it's called, um, about you know this, this factory that decides to implement Marx's dictum from each according to his ability to each according to his needs, okay? And it does not go well, <laughs> like, as, as you may know. Um, and you know, when I read that, so like, you know, first that slogan sounded right to me. You know, ah, yes, you should contribute according to your abilities, whatever, and you, know, you should receive according to your needs, okay. And then I read that story 
And my first reaction was, um, you know, this is not, this is not true socialism. This is not what they meant, which is true. That's not what they intended. But I, that my second thought was, but that is what would happen if you tried to implement it, right? Uh, which is, you know, like everybody starts trying to prove that they don't have any abilities so that they won't be expected to produce. And then they try to prove that they have lots of needs and they try to multiply their needs so that they receive more benefits. And like, this, this is not good, this is not gonna go well. So I realized that that is in fact what would happen. And so, you know, that's, that's when I started being libertarian, right? Awesome, so I'm gonna give uh, uh, Bruce the floor and then after he's done, uh, Calvin is gonna ask his question. So I'm gonna give Bruce the floor. Okay. Uh, thank yeah. you. Um, Michael Humer, it's, it's a, or sorry, Dr. Humer, it's a big honor to be here with you. So I'm very happy that you're here. Thank you very much. Thanks. Glad to be here. Um, yeah. Uh, so I just wanted to actually touch up on, you know, going back to how you felt about, um, about when you talked about Friedman and stuff. Um, I also had a question about another philosopher um, and po uh, politician, uh, not politician, sorry, uh, economic professor um, that you're probably well acquainted with. Uh, I just wanted to know your personal opinions, um, you know, from a philosophical and, uh, and uh, politically way, but also as a personal feeling on how you feel about Hans Hermann Hoppe. Cause I, I do enjoy his works, but I, I've never gotten to know what your opinion is on him. So if you could answer that, uh -huh. uh, that'd be great. Yeah, uh, you know, I have not read him, so <laughs> I can't say very much. I only heard other people talk about him. I understand that he's like anti-immigration, which you know I view as um, resulting from a misunderstanding of the libertarian principle. Um, yeah, and uh, I don't know, like, uh, what is it, does, it, does he have like this, uh, you know, homesteading theory of property or something of where you get rights from or something? Um, I think, well, uh, if it, the closest thing I think he's ever touched down on something like Argumentation that. Argumentation ethics? That yeah. 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 So like, I think I'm not going to agree with that. Um, but, you know, I can't say very much that's very useful. David Friedman, I think, has an article on that, uh, if you are interested. All right. Thank you. Thank you. May I have the floor? Yeah. Um, the question I had was based on libertarianism and its roots in America right now because America's polarized into this very two-party system. And do you think that libertarianism has its place in America today? And do you think it needs a rebranding? Oh, uh, um, it has a place in America. I mean, like uh, America might be the most libertarian country in the world, I'm not sure. Like, you know, I have, haven't checked, but it's definitely way more libertarian than other countries, right? You're like, you know, in fact, are all are all four of us in America, I think, right? Like this sort of event happens in America, doesn't really happen in other countries, right? And you know, there are a lot of, lot of things like that, like a lot more guns in America, like people in other countries don't, don't really care about, you know, gun ownership rights or whatever, and the things that are like big for libertarians. Um, I think, um, you know, like libertarians are pessimistic because we're a relatively small percentage of the population, I guess, or, um, at least like self-conscious, self-described libertarians. Um, but like uh, in some ways it's gotten more prominent and influential, at least that's my impression over the course of my lifetime, right? So I remember like, um, you know, IHS used to be a lot smaller, the Institute for Humane Studies, right? Like I went to some of their first summer seminars and then they greatly expanded after that. By the time I became a professor, they had multiple seminars you know they used to have one and then when I became a professor by that time they had multiple every year it was like there was no students for liberty back when I was in college right and they're all over now right so um you know and then uh, like in the academic philosophy world in my world um you know there weren't there weren't many libertarians you know like before Robert Nozick right and then I mean you know, unless you're counting like John Locke or something like that before Robert knows it. But anyway, like in academic philosophy, um, I don't know if there are any well-known libertarians before Robert knows it, right? But then after that, you know, there's there's more, right? There's like multiple people working in 
political philosophy who are libertarian and who are successful. So like, you know, it seems to me like we're doing okay. <laughs> we're, doing, we're not so bad. It's gonna take a, a while to take over. Okay. Does it need a rebranding was your second question. Um, and I guess, no, I don't think. Um, so, you know, the thing is like, you don't wanna, you don't want to change your name or whatever when people already know what it means because then you sort of like lose your existing following or whatever <laughs> like you know lo lose the people who already know um and then you know like i mean i i guess i guess what you might mean is like well maybe libertarians kind of like put a bad face on it sometimes <laughs> right so i think i think they're sort of like doctrinaire libertarians who make the philosophy sound dogmatic right which uh, I, I guess you shouldn't do, but you know, sometimes that works. Sometimes people like, um, you know, like a lot of people are converted by reading Ayn Rand. Like that might be the first, might be the first thing that leads you in, right? So um, no, no, it doesn't need a rebranding, I don't think. So our next question is from um, Carl and it is, <laughs> What do you think about the relationship between parents and children from an ethics standpoint? Do parents have positive obligations towards um, their children? And can the parent break certain rights of the children for their better good? I, I mean, I guess, um, you know, I guess I would say they have positive obligations to their children. Um, now, I might, I might think that just because it's the conventional view in our society and it's the, it's the convention, but you also kind of think, well, there are these kids, somebody's got to take care of them. You know, who's going to do it? And the parents are the ones who made the kids be there, right? So like, in a sense, it's like, oh, there's a problem for society. Like there's these kids who need to be cared for. The people who created that situation, they should care for them. Um, as, you know, you might say, oh, it's not a problem for society. Just let the kids die or whatever. <laughs> like, oh, we can just ignore them. This doesn't seem right. Um, now, you know, it's a little bit like, so, you know, imagine that, um, you know, there's somebody who is uh, stranded on a desert island and you put them there, <laughs> then, then you are responsible for doing something, you know, about their situation, right? Responsible for making sure they survive or whatever. Now, that's not a perfect analogy because, you know, when you put the person on the island, they existed before you put them there and the child didn't exist before you put them here. But still, there's some, you know, um, there's some parallel there. Um, can the parents violate the children's rights? Uh, no, but the children might not have the same rights as adults have. And why? Because um, they don't have mature judgment, right? Like some, some of your rights depend upon your um, cognitive capacities, like your ability to exercise judgment and run your own life. Um, so, you know, I kind of feel like it's okay for the children to say, no, you can't play on the freeway, <laughs> whatever. Uh, like, well, maybe you can, you can also stop adults from playing on the freeway, but let's say, you know, no, you may not have a vial of heroin. <laughs> I feel like that's okay. You can't say that to an adult, but it's partly because, you know, if you'd say that to an adult, you're treating them like a child, but it is okay to treat a child like a child, but it's not okay to treat an adult like a child. Right, so um, I'll give the floor to Bruce. Um, all right, um, you know, I actually think it's interesting that we're touching on philosophy considering that it actually is gateway into what I was just about to ask. Um, I think, you know, the world of philosophy and libertarian is um, inconcernable in the sense that, you know, they need one another. They're sort of symbiotic. Um, libertarianism is, you know, as much of a philosophy as much as nihilism is, in my opinion. Um, but for what I really want to ask you is, is there any particular, um, is there any particular, is there any particular sort of um, philosophies that are concerned with uh, libertarianism that you concern yourself with on a daily basis or so? Um, I mean, a little, I'm a little unsure what kind of philosophies we're thinking of here, other than libertarianism itself. Well, anything in particular, like individualism, empiricism, materialism, all those sorts of uh, um, philosophies, more the ones that make up libertarianism as a whole. 
Yeah, I see. Uh, well, yeah, I mean, so I don't know if this is exactly responsive. I mean, I'm a rationalist in epistemology um, and an ethical intuitionist in metaethics, right? Which, you know, okay, so, you know, political philosophy should be based on ethics. Um, so ethics studies, you know, the nature of value and the nature of right and wrong, and political philosophy is a special case of that, right? So like ethics talks about obligations in general, and then political philosophy tells you about the obligations of the state and the obligations of us towards the state and things like that, right? But so it's just a special case. And, you know, and then there's this branch of metaethics that studies like, well, how do we know stuff about right and wrong and good and bad, right? So, you know, on that, um, yeah, so I have the intuitionist philosophy according to which um, our knowledge of right and wrong and good and bad depends upon our ethical intuitions, right, which result from um, when you think about something, you think about some type of action, it will just seem right or seem wrong to you. And, you know, you get to assume that that's correct unless you have reason for thinking otherwise. Um, now, I don't like, I wouldn't say that I use my philosophies in everyday life. Like um, most, most of it's fairly abstract, uh, except of course, I try to not violate people's rights in my everyday life. So like in that sense, you know, I'm using the libertarian philosophy because I'm not attacking anyone <laughs> and I'm not defrauding anyone. Yeah. So next question is a bit wordy, uh, but um, do you think that Quine's argument for the uh, indeterminacy of translation was a byproduct of his behaviorism on language and do you think that do you think stating yeah. something along the lines of there is no difference without physical difference hence there is no possible world where i could say rabbit and mean anything else than what i mean in the world given that there is no um physical difference across the worlds uh, oh uh that's his question okay good yeah <laughs> I don't, it's a little complicated so uh, yes, the thing about indeterminacy of translation stems from the behaviorism, you know, which stems from a kind of like his irrational empiricism, you know, like he's like he so much hates a priori knowledge, that, uh, you know, he wants to say everything is based on observation. And so therefore, when you're attributing mental states to other people, you can, you know, you can only like rely on observation of their physical behavior, right? And then you're like, oh, okay, so, you know, you see in his example, you see somebody from this uh, other tribe whose language you don't know, and they, you see them pointing in the direction of a rabbit and saying, Gavagai, <laughs> and you're trying to figure out what Gavagai means. And you're like, maybe it means rabbit, or maybe it means undetached rabbit part, or maybe it means rabbit time slice, or whatever. <laughs> you come up with these other ridiculous translations. Okay, and then what a normal person would think so like, obviously I think that this thesis is not correct, right? Like, um, I mean, in some sense, yes, there are multiple possible translations, but there aren't multiple reasonable translations, right? You know, of, of anything. Like sometimes there are multiple reasonable translations, but there aren't always, right? So like thinking that they mean rapid time slice is not reasonable, right? But that depends upon you know, like some, some reasoning that's not exactly empiricist, right? It's not because that doesn't fit the behavior that's physically observable, that that's not reasonable. It's because that, why would they be pointing to, you know, why would they be thinking that, right? Because like, that's not a sensible thing to be thinking when there's just a rabbit. You could be talking about the rabbit. Um, and, you know, sort of like it's simpler, it's more obvious and you know, sort of like rely upon their psychology to be somewhat similar to your own and whatever. Um, I've forgotten about what the other part of the question was. Um, um, so it was like, um, the first part was, you know, Quine's argument for the indeterminacy of translation. Do you think it was a byproduct of uh, his behaviorism on language? Right. right. So yes. <laughs> yeah. And what, what was the last part of it? Uh, and it was like, um, do you, or, or he says to rephrase like any possible world state in which the physical facts exactly match the physical facts in the actual state of the world is a yeah, world okay, state yeah. in which all facts match, match the actual facts. Okay. Yeah. So, so I'm not a physicalist, so I don't think that's necessarily true, but it may be true as a matter of the causal laws. So, um, 
I mean, yeah, so can there be two cases where there's the same physical states but different mental states? Um, like, you know, same behavior and same, people say the same words, but like they have different thoughts in their minds. Um, okay, that's possible, but there would be different states of their brain. So the total physical state would not be the same. It may be a matter of like the correct causal laws of our universe that you can't have different mental states and have the same brain state. However, that doesn't exactly, that doesn't matter exactly for his indeterminacy of translation because when you translate somebody's language, you do not scan their brain, right? And the differences in the brain states of people who have different meanings would not necessarily be detectable, like would not be detectable with current technology, right? Um, and, you know, may, maybe not even with very advanced technology. So, um, yeah. Um, Okay, so um, yeah, like the, like the supervenience thesis is probably true, but not super helpful. All right, um, so our next question is, what do you think about the agorist class theory suggested by Konkin? Wow, I don't know, what is this theory? Um, I have no, I have no clue. <laughs> <laughs> if, if, you could... if I'll chime in, uh, I, it's, I mean, the agorist theory of Konkin is just sort of weird um, in the sense that there's an actual theory behind um, of how agorism works, which in my opinion, if I'm, you know, I know this isn't my AMA, but if I'm going to chime in here, I, I really don't think there is much of a theory behind agorism in that regard, but it, it really is just trying to justify it on a, on a more philosophical scale of agorism. Yeah, yeah I, th I thought it was just a, a methodology. So I'm kind of yeah, exactly. It really <laughs> just is a methodology, but you know, it, like he like like what he's trying to say is just basically there is reason and rhymed behind it, and there's an actual uh, philosophy behind it. Okay. Yeah. So, yeah. So you know, I I would have to read more <laughs> to have any useful comments about that. Sorry. Oh. Uh. Moto Dragon wants to know how you define praxeology, but I'm assuming he wants to kind of just know your thoughts on praxeology more generally as well. Yeah. Yeah. You know, like I, I was recently privy to a discussion between Walter Block and David Friedman about uh, Austrian economics. And, you know, it just seemed to me like David Friedman kept being right. And like, you know, the Austrians kept being wrong about everything that he, that he disputed. So, um, like, you know, so what, I guess one of the issues is, is economics an a priori discipline or is it empirical, at least partly empirical or something? And, you know, I kind of thought, well, like, yeah, these Austrian economists are saying stuff is a priori that doesn't look a priori to me, right? So like Walter Block was saying, oh, well, if two people make a trade, then uh, both of them are better off. Or he would put the qualification like they are ex ante better off. I think what he actually meant was they expect to be better off. Um, and I think like, uh, and then he was saying like, that's a synthetic a priori truth. You know, it's like, that you can just prove from self-evident axioms. And that's not true, that's empirical. Like it's an extremely plausible empirical generalization, right? Like it's an empirical generalization that comes from like very general facts about human nature. Like human beings are self-interested but it is not like an a priori necessary truth, right? Um, you know, other things are like, oh, the Austrian economists reject um, cardinal utility. They think like there's no quantities of satisfaction or something. And I just think that's wrong. Like there is something, you know, like you get different desires satisfied, right? And they could be satisfied to different degrees. Is it possible for something to be twice as satisfying as another, as a conceptual matter? Yes, it is. Right. It's like you're not it's you're not limited to saying this is better than this other thing. Something could also be like a certain amount better. It could be better by a certain amount. OK. Uh, and then as far as I can tell, like they've got no good reason for denying that. They just have like um, you feel sort of like, you know, weirdly positivist verificationist reasons. Right. And I'm sure some Austrian is going to say, oh, no, you're completely misunderstanding us because they say that, you know, I don't know. People, are, people say that whenever you criticize them trenchantly. Oh, no. Anyway, <laughs> but, um, you know, like, 
And I don't know why you should deny the thing that seems obvious. Um, they also like deny that you could have interpersonal utility comparisons, as far as I understand it, which just seems obviously wrong, right? Mm -hmm. Like I could get more enjoyment out of something than you do. That's not incoherent. That's not a conceptual confusion. That's just obviously true. And as far as I can tell, like the sort of weirdly verificationist type argument is, well, you can't verify by looking at people's physical behavior. That one, you know, you can't like absolutely with certainty verify by looking at their physical behavior. <laughs> that one person got more enjoyment than the other. Well, so what? <laughs> that seems like a pretty bad argument. Um, anyway, okay, so uh, yeah, there's, I don't know, th those are my brief thoughts. I don't know, I don't, like I, you know, not an economist or anything, but anyway, those are my impressions of the major, major shortcomings. That debate, by the way, guys, if you haven't seen it, is up on our YouTube channel. Um, and so uh, our next question is, someone wants to know how you would respond to the coconut analogy. Wow, okay. Uh, and, and what's the coconut analogy? Anyone know? Uh, analogy to what? I know it, but it's uh, I'm not good at explaining it. Oh, yeah, he, he left an explanation. So you crashed on an island with another person while you're unconscious. The other person gathers up all the coconuts uh, or and food which you'd also need to survive. And then is only willing to trade with, with trade you some in exchange for sexual favors. Is this, <laughs> is this coercive? How is this different than the pressure on workers in a capitalist society? Oh, I see. Um, I mean, so the somewhat standard libertarian view about property, I think is the Lockean view. Uh, okay, I don't know if the, I don't know the standard, but anyway, Locke's view of property was that you can uh, claim unowned resources that are in nature, but provided that you leave enough for others, and, right? And also, like you can, you only get to claim the stuff that you're actually doing something with. Okay, so like in this scenario, it's I think it's not legitimate to claim that you own all the coconuts. Right. So first of all, like you haven't done anything useful, you know, with all these coconuts and you're not using all of them. So, um, you know, like you, you get to claim land by doing some useful work and improving it or something like that, mixing your labor with the land. But I don't think that just like moving the coconut into a pile and saying this is mine, that that counts <laughs> um, as, you know, mixing your labor and increasing its value or whatever. Also, of course, um, you know, you can't, you can't just like claim all of it, even if you are doing something useful, if there are other people who need it, right? So like, I would say that as, as constraints on the initial acquisition, because you didn't uh, acquire the stuff legitimately, that means that you don't actually have the right to demand whatever, <laughs> sexual favors or whatever in exchange for a coconut, right? That's, that's what I would think. Uh, so the next question is, um... What is your take on modal realism? And do you think it's useful in counterfactual analysis uh, of causation? Yeah, yeah good, good question. Um, yeah, so modal realism is uh, ridiculous. <laughs> so the way that this term is usually used, okay, I, I say this because the term is, I think it's misleading. It sounds like it means that you think modal facts are real. Modal facts being facts about something being possible or necessary or impossible. Um, and I think those are real. Like there's a fact that two plus two equals four is necessary. And that's really true and it's objective and it's not you know, created by human conventions or whatever. But the way the word is used in metaphysics, it refers to the idea that there are actually a whole bunch of parallel universes where every logically possible thing is happening. Every, any logically possible thing is happening in a parallel universe somewhere, really. Like, and that they exist in exactly the same sense that this universe exists. And that that's what we're talking about when we use the words possible and necessary and so on. That's ridiculous. That is not what, okay. I, I like, there's no reason to think that there are parallel universes just because we have this language of talking about possibility. Maybe there are parallel universes because people are saying this in physics, but even if there are, that is definitely not what we're talking about when we use modal language, right? Um, okay, anyway, and so, you know, I kind of grow, go with Kripke on the interpretation of possible worlds talk, right? It's sort of a façon de parler. There's not really another possible world in the sense that there's this world, right? There's a 
you know, there are possible worlds in the sense of hypothetical scenarios. Those are not the same kind of thing as this world. Um, is it useful for analyzing counterfactuals? No. Um, so, you know, like I, I think Lewis's analysis of counterfactuals was refuted a long time ago. So this is not like a, you know, original point with me, right? Okay. So, you know, Lewis's analysis is, um, if A were true, B would be true. It means something like in the nearest possible world in which A is true, B is true. The nearest possible world is like the possible world that's most similar to, to this world. Okay. And then, so, you know, here's a, here's an example of a counterfactual. Um, if I were either an inch taller than I am or two inches taller than I am, I would only be an inch taller. Is that true? Okay. And what you should think is no, if you're a normal person, no, that's indeterminate. I could, if I were either one or two inches, it could be either one. You can't say that it would be the one. Okay, but the world in which I'm only one inch taller is closer to the actual world than the one where I'm two inches taller. Right, so the analysis delivers the incorrect result that that's a true counterfactual, right? And then, you know, there's a bunch of stuff that's like that. Um, you know, there's, there's like a, I think, I think I like this example better, okay? Although this is going on, you know, for a while, but anyway, there's a bit, bit tangential. Um, okay, this example, um, suppose that Richard Nixon had a big red button in his office that was designed to launch all the nuclear weapons. Okay, and one day he was sitting there, you know, with his finger hovering over the button, wondering if he should just launch all the missiles at Russia, you know, <laughs> and uh, assume that in actual fact, there was nothing wrong with the button. Uh, like all the wires were connected in the way that they're supposed to be. And like all of the soldiers in the silos were disposed to launch if they were given the order. Okay, and now true or false, if Nixon had pushed that button, there would have been nuclear war. And the answer is, so if you're a normal person, obviously that's true. Okay, but wait, here, <laughs> there's a closer possible world because if Nixon launches, he presses the button and then there's a nuclear war, that world is way different from the actual world at, at, at every point after that. So here's another possible world. He could push the button and then just for no reason, there could just be a, ma a malfunction in the button, even though there wasn't in fact anything wrong with it. But you know, take the possible world in which the button malfunctions and then there's no nuclear war, that's closer to the actual world. It's more similar to this world. So, right, so the analysis delivers the incorrect result that if you push the button, everything would have been fine, right? So anyway, okay, that was, that was a long digression. Brandon right there, yeah. <laughs> um, so do you think that in an anarcho-capitalist society, we would be broken into covenant communities? And if so, do you think these Major, these would be uh, majority conservative or major, more progressive? Oh, uh, I don't know. Well, I guess I would say, I, I think, okay, so, you know, we have these like uh, homeowners associations, you know, which I have because I'm in a condo. We have one for the, uh, for the whole build, building. Um, and, you know, that would probably spread. There'd probably be even more. So, you know, maybe everyone would have an HOA because um, they wanted to provide security, like they would, they would hire the security guards or whatever. Um, now, would they be left-wing or right-wing predominantly? I think predominantly they would be apolitical because most normal human beings, not like us, you know, we're not normal human beings. Most normal human beings are not politically invested. Like they just don't care that much, okay? So if a surveyor comes by and asks you, what's your political affiliation? Like the majority of people will say they're Democrat or Republican, but they don't actually care that much. And they do not spend a lot of time thinking about it. And, you know, like, so, you know, they would just, they would just be moderate, right? Most people actually I think most people would consider themselves moderate, right? But the reason they consider themselves moderate is that they just don't care that much, right? They just want to get on with their day, you know? And so, yeah. So, I mean, you could have questions like, um, oh, you know, would, would your HOA ban drugs, recreational drugs? Um, my guess, probably most of them would, um, because probably most people don't want to be around drug users. They just don't like it, right? And, you know, and they, you know, even like people who don't want it to be illegal in the status quo wouldn't want it in their, <laughs> they wouldn't want their neighbors to be doing it. So, but then there would be some for, you know, the druggies. <laughs> it would be some, it would be like a neighborhood of druggies. And then, you know, they would, they would allow it. Great. So um, 
I'm going to give Calvin the floor now. Uh, the question I had was um, was specifically on um, a right unity because some people believe for libertarianism or libertarian ideas to be uh, pushed forward in, in America, there has to be a, a, a form of unity amongst uh, the very conservative right and the more liberal right, and even in some people's cases, uh, fascists with libertarians, which... Um, which, in my opinion, is not possible. But what what are your thoughts on it as a as a oh, uh, thinker? Yeah, I mean, like, well, we don't need the fascists. <laughs> like, I mean, you know, besides the fact that we don't agree with them, um, we don't need them because, like, <laughs> how, how much power do fascists have? <laughs> right? Like, yeah, let's let's ally ourselves with like white supremacist Nazis, uh, and then we're totally going to take over. No, like. <laughs> In fact, I think they have like negative power in the sense that you add them to your movement. Now you have less influence than you had before. <laughs> that's, that's what happens. Um, you know, we could um, ally with the Republicans, but I think this is getting more difficult. I mean, there's been a sort of like a sort of an alliance between libertarians and Republicans, right, for a while. Like, I think most libertarians vote Republican. Um, you know, that was better like in the Reagan era, which I'm old enough to remember. Barely. Um, it's less good in the Trump era. So, like, I think Reagan was more, um, it was a little more ideological, which I mean in a good way. Uh, like, he cared about, you know, cared somewhat about political, philosophical beliefs. Right? And he had this, he at least had a message that the government is too big and we need to shrink it. And I don't even see that among Republicans today. Like, all you know, they were taken over by Trump, and like, um, like I don't see that Trump cares about shrinking the government, right? Um, I mean, I think uh, you know after after I say that, I realize like I think he did do some deregulation. Uh, on the other hand, like you know, greatly expanded the deficit and total federal spending. Um, and but anyway, but like that's not even his main message. His main message is um, anti-immigrant. You know, immigrants are bad. And so, and which I regard as like an anti libertarian message. So, anyway, like it's hard to ally with them at that point. Right? It's like, like I'm okay with allying with people who are mostly on your side or like their main idea is on your side, but you disagree about some issues. But like if the main thing that they're known for is wrong, then I don't, I don't really see how that's going to help. Right, so um, Lilith, you have the floor now, and then after that, Liji. Um, you hear me? Yeah. yeah. Okay. So basically my question, uh, I actually asked the question about uh, the covenant communities being more progressive or conservative. And what I meant by that, not necessarily people being political, but um, even now in America, like more communities care about uh, culture preservation while other communities care about more accepting. So would it be more prevalent for the social ostracization of people like LGBT community or drug users or whatever would be degenerate to the local culture? Uh, would that be more prevalent or do you think that people would be more accepting? Uh, okay, so I missed some of that question. Because uh, there's some cutting out a little bit. Oh, okay. But, uh, um, so, like, so you're saying like some some communities are more interested in cultural preservation, and then some are more interested in something else that I missed. Um, some are more interested in cultural preservation, while others are more interested in progression and acceptance. Uh, my my basic question was: Do you think like? not necessarily political, but more like they care about the community. So do you think like the so social ostracization of in people like LGBT community or uh, drug users or that are like people that would yeah. be considered degenerate to the local culture, would that be more uh, prevalent or would people be more accepting? Oh, um, I mean, at this point in America, people don't care about homosexuality. And like, I think, so, I mean, there was a time when you would have worried that, you know, like, you know, 
some some gated community would say, oh yeah, we prohibit gays, or you know, we're not going to let any gays live here. Uh, I, but I think that would be very rare now, um, just because like the cult, the whole culture is shifting. In fact, even like yeah, even self-described conservatives, they don't they don't have a problem with that anymore. Um, you know, there's the stuff about like the drug users. Like I think people would still not they still don't want to be around them. But it's not so much an ideological thing as like just um, you don't like smelling the drugs, you don't like seeing the people like passed out on the, on the street or whatever. Just not, you know, the doesn't seem good. It's not, I was, you know, like it's not so much like, oh, not so much a moralistic thing, like, oh, they're being immoral. Um, it's just like, you know, it's just not nice for our community. Because, you know, as I say again, like I think most people are not that ideological. Um, and, you know, like I've, uh, I've been in HOAs and yeah, they're, they're typically not ideological. They're typically just like, let's have this be a nice place. Let's keep the property values up, you know, have the place be clean and whatever. And like, you know, let's update the common areas, you know, with the fancy stuff. But then, you know, like if there's drug users just like in the parking lot sleeping there, then somebody in, in the HOA would be like, yeah, let's stop that because it, you know, it's lowering our property values, whatever. It doesn't look nice. Um, so I, I don't, I don't know if that really answered your question. All right. So, um, Bruce, you can go now. Um, I want to touch back on, you know, how you were talking about the uh, Republican Party and Libertarians in a way that they're kind of allied. Um, and I want to talk, talk about that a bit more specifically, um, you know, on this, on the level, yeah, I do agree with you that libertarians and Republicans are allied, at least in the regard of a more moderate Republican, which is probably more like, I don't even know, probably more like 75%, but the rest of them, you know, they probably wouldn't agree with libertarianism in that regard, um, because of, you know, I would say how, con uh, conflated or, uh, um, you know, how contemplated they are with, you know, being allied with Trump in that regard. But what I want a more uh, specific answer is if we were to have, if we could never get to the point where we can stand on our own two feet and we do have to always rely on the Republicans in that regard to even get any sort of uh, political preservation, um, do you think we would need to ally with them more on a level of how large the government should be or on a level of what our market stance should be? Uh, I mean, I'm not sure I see this distinction and what, what our market stance should be like, what, like how the government like how direct free with the market. market or, yeah. How free market we are. Like, cause I think, I think we can, I mean, personally, I can honestly separate how big a government can be and how free market we can be as well. Um, and that's just in my opinion, but if you can't, uh, separate the two, then that honestly also answers my question at the same time. Yeah, I mean, so, because they seem, so, you know, like, how much regulation should we have? That seems to me like both issues. Um, and I guess, uh, I guess Republicans still, still are generally in favor of less regulation, right? Like, they haven't, they haven't shifted position on that. Like, you know, they're, you know, if you're around for a few decades, you see, like, the, you see the two sides, like, shifting their positions, you know? Like, um, and so, you know, like, oh, now Republicans don't like free trade anymore because, because Trump, because he doesn't like free trade because he doesn't like foreigners. <laughs> but anyway, but I don't think that they shifted their position on regulation yet. So that's good. And then there's like, um, so, I mean, that's one measure of the size of government and also, you know, how free the market is. Another thing is like the, the budget, right? And like, yeah, I mean, we should try to get the Republicans back to you know, we should shrink the budget and have less deficits. Um, but like, it seems like they gave up caring about the budget and the and the debt because Trump didn't care about it because Trump likes having lots of debt. And, and because he thinks, like, I think his view is like, if you, you can just borrow a bunch of money from people and then if you can't pay it back, no problem. Just tell them you can't pay it back. <laughs> just like, just tell them, you know what? I'll give you fifty cents on the dollar. You're like, make a negotiation in which you agree to not pay back what you owe, and you know, you just tell them, well, you got to take it because otherwise you're getting nothing. 
<laughs> anyway, but like, I think that's his personal attitude. And so now the Republicans are like, oh yeah, like our dear leader doesn't care about debt. So we don't care about debt anymore. We never cared about it. You know, we were lying the whole time. Anyway, let's, let's try to get back to actually caring about that, right? All right, so next question is, um, what is your response to the arguments made against voluntary interactions that say that humans are naturally irrational and don't know what they are doing, justified by many pro-state people. Yeah, yeah. I mean, uh, yeah, well, I mean, people are frequently irrational. I mean, there are a couple of things to say, like first, um, okay, so people are sometimes irrational and sometimes rational. Are they mostly rational or mostly irrational? Well, if you're mostly irrational, then you are going to die soon, right? And like, we wouldn't have made it this far. So, uh, you know, let's say that you're hungry and uh, so therefore you jump off a cliff because you're irrational, right? Like, well, that's not what most people do. <laughs> like when most people are hungry, they look for food because they have a basic level of rationality. And like the whole, you know, all of human life wouldn't make any sense unless there was a basic level of rationality. That being said, there are exceptions, right? Like you have to remind people of this obvious, you know, the obvious point, like the obvious way in which people are rational. And then yes, there are, there are times when we're irrational. Like there are times when you don't do the optimal thing, but you don't do some like completely random stupid thing, right? But you do something that's, you know, suboptimal, you make a fallacy or whatever, okay? And that's, that's all true. But anyway, the main problem with that is um, we don't have anyone other than people. So like, we don't have any angels that we can look to and like say the, you know, angels who never make mistakes and like say, hey, you guys tell us what to do. There are no such beings, right? Or maybe there are, but they are not coming, right? Like maybe there are angels and God, but they're not gonna show up and help us out in that way. We only have other people, right? So like the argument would have to be, oh yeah, but like government officials are more rational than the rest of us, right? And, but not only are they more rational, but also like they're altruistic rational people, right? Because they care about you more than they care about us. Because that's the only way that you, predict that they're, when they govern you, they're going to govern you for your own self-interest and like cause you to serve your interests better than you would on your own. And that is not true. That's obviously not true, right? Like they're, they're so, as selfish as the rest of us, probably more so, right? The average politician is probably more selfish than the average human being. And they're not super rational. They're not known for being super smart and super rational or super well-informed. They're just good at manipulating people. Like that's the main skill of a politician. But anyway, manipulating people for their own self-interest. So like, yes, we make mistakes, but that's not a reason to give more power to the politician. All right, so our next question is, um, what are your thoughts on solipsism? Uh, yeah, you know, I'm reminded of a, uh, amusing anecdote that, you know, Bertrand Russell, he had, he had written about this and like apparently somebody sent him a letter one time saying, you know, I'm a solipsist and I don't understand why there aren't more of us. Balls. So anyway, um, I'm pretty sure that there's more that exists than me. <laughs> I'm pretty sure that you exist. I'm pretty sure that somebody wrote that question and it wasn't me. Um, so I think, I think it's not true. Um, that if you want to know about how we know about the external world, I have a great book to recommend called Skepticism and the Veil of Perception, my first book from 2001, um, you know, which explains how you're justified in believing stuff about the external world. Okay. Um, but, you know, like an important part of it is that, um, you know, I argue that it's rational to assume that things are the way they seem unless you have a reason to doubt that. All right. So, um... I'm going to open the floor for uh, Lilith now. Uh, you go ahead. Uh, let me lower my hand first. Okay. So basically, uh, I have, do, are you aware of what the block in perverso is? Uh, oh, lock in proviso. Yeah. On acquisition of property rights. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, do you think that's correct? I guess. Right. I mean, I guess it's, you know, some version of it. Um, well, so basically like can do you think that applies to more than just like land property um i i guess i mean like what i mean i'm not sure what other things there are to acquire i mean there's 
right? I mean, there's stuff that's not exactly land, but it's on land, right? So, well, of course, everything is like on a basis of property, but um, for example, like people can use it to make arguments on children, like um, sorry, or, like, like, to make arguments on what? On things like the right to children or the right to like fetuses, like and like for the block in perverso, because how uh, you you can't encircle someone and uh that not let them out because uh that's doesn't line up with property rights so you have to allow them a path because you're effectively homesteading a property property that's not theirs uh and this is like used by like departurist and stuff so i just wanted to know what you thought about it yeah, I, I mean, so I agree about that part that like, uh, you know, so, okay, there's somebody who's living on a plot of land, you can't like just claim all the land around him and then not let him out. You can claim that land, but you have to let him pass through it to, um, you know, access the rest of society, it seems right. Um, me about, I'm not sure how this relates to fetuses and children. Good. Um, well, can you say more about that? Oh well, the uh, argument, like the argument there, is like, so some people say that babies are like they own themselves, like immediately, conception, right? So effectively, they're saying that you you can't, or you can, or you can't abort it based on this. Um, oh, okay, you're killing, killing the baby by aborting it, and there's like things that the general mis principle that that goes into a whole other. Yeah, I mean, um, well, if fetuses are persons, then they own themselves. But uh, and you know, but but I don't know whether they count as persons or not. And that's a difficult question because there's a continuous development from something that's clearly non-person-like, which is you know like the the first cell, and something that's clearly a person, which is like you know us, like real people there's just like there's a continuous development between those so there's not a single sharp point where something clearly different happens although if you believe in the soul there might be a point where the soul enters the body but that's unobservable so we we can't really know um so we we don't really know when it first becomes a person um but you know when it first becomes a person then i think it automatically owns itself um Okay, but there's also this question like, um, oh, well, even if the fetus owns itself, you know, there's kind of a libertarian argument that, well, that doesn't mean that it, it has the right to use the mother's body. Like it doesn't have a right to live there, even if it needs to do that in order to survive, right? Because, you know, you know, property rights. So the mother owns her own body. So you might think actually she could still kick, kick the fetus out. Well, do you, do you think, like, I just want to know, like, do you think because, like, a mother and a father make a baby, do they own that child, or does the child own themselves? Oh, the child owns itself, yeah. You can't mm -hmm. own another okay. person. Okay. Um, and, um, you know, you might think, like, you know, like I was saying earlier, well, children don't have all the same rights as adults, but that definitely doesn't mean that they can be property, right? You can't do that. Um you might think, oh, but you know, the parents created the child by doing some labor. <laughs> That's true, but I think that that, like that principle of how you acquire property, only applies to things that are uh, the right kind of thing to be owned in the first place. I guess uh, non sentient <laughs> material <laughs> material possessions, essentially. Yeah. Right. And so, okay, the child is a, a material object, but it's not it's not ownable. I guess. All right, so next question is from um, Jason, and this is either the last or one of the last questions that we're going to get to. Um, do you think that highly respected judges in an anarchist society would end up being like Plato's philosopher kings, uh, i.e. a commonly accepted ruler with a love of wisdom? Oh, uh, hmm. Well, um, I mean, they're, you know, they're not supposed to be viewed as a ruler. So, like, you know, what happens in... Plato's world and Plato's society is, oh, they just get to like tell everybody what to do all the time. But what judges are supposed to do is just resolve a case. And so like they don't, 
And then this is part of why it's better than legislators, right? This is, this is one reason why common law is better than legislative law, because the legislature can just like, they can make a rule any time. And the judge can only make a rule if there's a specific case, right? And all they can really do, like he can't unilaterally make everyone follow that rule. He can make the rule for that case. And that's one reason why there's not, there's not the incentive to go around lobbying judges in the way there's the incentive to go around lobbying politicians. Um, so anyway, so like this is part of why I want to say they're not like rulers. They get to resolve your case if you go to them. <laughs> if you and the other party that you have a dispute with go to them. Uh, and then their rule gets adopted by other judges, but only if the other judges think that it makes sense, right? So you gotta try to like make the thing that, you know, make the rule that seems to make sense to most people. Um, and, but anyway, like would they be like philosophers with a love of wisdom? Um, probably not exactly, right? Cause they would probably have more narrow interests. They would have interests in like how to resolve human disputes and, so philosophers tend to have much more abstract interests, right? They care about abstract general rules and the judge is not really supposed to be that into that, right? Like he's supposed to be into what's the right way of resolving this exact case? Not like I'm gonna tell everybody, you know, what the truth is in a general way. Right, so our next question is, do you think that the preemption uh, problem is sufficiently deadly to any accounts of counterfactual causation? Uh, and oh, also sorry, the preemption problem was that yeah that the preemption question? problem yeah uh, and also in your opinion when it comes to uh, uh, micro uh, psychism or, or I don't even know how to pronounce that is the subject uh, summing problem remotely possible to solve uh, micro psychism is that I'm not I'm not sure what I know I'm not sure I know what that is is that like panpsychism we're like the part okay, the person didn't elaborate, so you don't know. It's uh, not my area of expertise. Yeah. <laughs> Again, um, is the preemption problem fatal to counterfactual accounts of causation? Uh, I don't know. So on its face is a strong objection, but then I didn't I didn't exactly read the literature on this. So like, so I don't exactly know what the best responses are. Um, oh, he says it's um he says it's a version of pan psychism. Oh, okay, yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I don't, like my general take on panpsychism is uh, that doesn't solve anything. <laughs> so, like, uh, okay, so I'm conscious and you're conscious. Okay, so like the five people in this Zoom meeting are conscious, but there is not another consciousness that is made up, like that's, you know, the five of us conjoined. There's not a consciousness for the group of five, right? That's not a mind. Okay, and so the, like the thing is, even if each particular atom were conscious, that wouldn't explain why we're conscious. Okay, also, by the way, like if you did, even if you did think that it somehow explained that, then why doesn't it make the table conscious? Because it contains as many conscious atoms as we do. <laughs> like, so, so then you got to say something about how the particles in our brain are interacting with each other. But whatever you say, like there's got to be something that's special about the brain that's different from the table. Yeah, you could say, oh, well, the table is conscious too, but you probably want to say at minimum that it's not as conscious as a person is. Like a, probably you want to say a person has a higher degree of consciousness than a table. Assume it's a table containing the same number of particles, okay, <laughs> as a person. Um, okay, so you probably want to say that. So then you got to say something about what's special about people, which is the original problem anyway. Right, like the original problem of explaining consciousness, you still have. You have to say what's special about brains that differentiate from every other physical object. And then when you say that, and it's not that it contains a bunch of particles. And then when you say that, that could just be your theory of consciousness, right? Whatever that is. So then now you don't need the stuff where everything else is also conscious. One of my other problems with panpsychism, well, so like I don't know exactly what panpsychists would say. Like, okay, everything is conscious. What do you mean by everything? So this sounds to me like this presupposes a privileged way of dividing up reality, right? Uh, so like, it, okay, so people are conscious. Like we have that as a fixed point. The theory has to recover that. Our table's conscious. Then suppose you say, okay, yeah, every material object is conscious. Okay, what about the, this table that I'm sitting at plus my left eyeball? So is that, that's an object, right? Is that, is that an object? I don't know, but is that conscious? 
And then like, you know, there's that plus the moon. Is that a conscious being? Okay, and now, you know, if you say no, then what you're doing is presupposing that our, um, our way of dividing up the world is metaphysically privileged, which it is not, right? There's no like metaphysical difference. There's no qualitative difference, right? Uh, and then you could say, yeah, all those things are conscious. Well, okay, but then it's like, how many minds are there? <laughs> like, like every combination of particles in the universe. Okay, but then the thing is like, you know, what is this explaining that we need explained? Because, <laughs> right, like there's no evidence for these things being conscious, right? So anyway, not a, not a super plausible theory. Kind of just the whole catch all that consciousness is subjective in that regard. Yeah, I mean, yeah, so it's like, oh, well, it's, it's unobservable. So, you know, you can't really know what's conscious or not. So that does make it logically possible that the table is conscious. But if, it, if the consciousness is not doing anything to its behavior, then there's no reason to believe that it is. <laughs> right, one final question. It's a pretty simple question. Uh, what is the best philosopher of all time and why? <laughs> I don't know. Uh, is it me? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I'll give it to you. <laughs> um, I mean, I mean, you know, in some in some sense, like Aristotle is the greatest philosopher of all time, right? Because, like, um, why? Um, you know, you know how much he did. Like, you know, he wrote seminal works in multiple different areas that became, like, his theories became the dominant theories for a very long time, right? So, like, okay, so he founded the whole field of logic. There's like not that many people who created a whole field of study. So anyway, he created the field of study of logic, and his logic was the logic for 2000 years. It was like up until Frege about like Aristotelian logic was logic, right? But then, but it wasn't just that. It was like, you know, he wrote stuff in ethics and metaphysics and then like biology and like cosmology and physics and whatever, okay? And he's completely wrong, but nevertheless, there's something great. There's something like, there's something amazing about like you know, doing, creating the central accepted theories for a thousand or 2000 years in many different areas. Like there's nobody that's comparable to that. Great, thank you so much for joining us, Dr. Humer. Really appreciate you coming on. Um, uh, if it's okay with you, we will put this up on YouTube um, and I'll make sure to send you that recording before I upload it. Um, great. Thank you so much. Uh, it's a really you, fun Dr. conversation. Humer. Thank yeah. you, Dr. Hero. Great. We yeah. wish Thank to you. have you, you for organizing time. Yeah. No problem. Thank you for answering my questions, Dr. Humor. <laughs>